Hello everyone, it's Friday, August 25th, 2017. This is your host, Taylor Carr, and you're listening to the Armchair Atheism Podcast, the official podcast of godlesshaven.com. This is episode number 12, and for this one I talk with philosopher Kevin Shelbrock about the concept of religion. We touch on a lot of different issues, including the history of the term, how it's been understood popularly and academically, what we should take into consideration in defining religion, and much more. Prior to recording this episode, I was asked by my guest about why I decided to do a podcast like this. It made me realize that it might be worth saying more on this for those who haven't been with the show since the first episode, which is now quite a while ago. The intent of this podcast is not to preach atheism, to talk current events, or to promote secular activism, for which there are many other such podcasts already. I prefer to see what I do here as engaging in conversations, ones that I hope can interest people of different backgrounds and walks of life. These are dialogues on religion, atheism, and related subjects, and I don't try to hide my skeptical and critical perspective. I do structure these episodes and these topics around questions that I think are worth contemplating, though, and I aim to do this not in a manner that serves up commonplace or ready-made atheist viewpoints, but that challenges both myself and my listeners to dig deeper. The question of this episode in particular is a prime example of why I'm interested in this sort of thing. I do genuinely find these subjects fascinating on their own, although I also can't help noticing how religion gets defined in some circles in ways that seem... Well, counterproductive, to say the least. Christians telling atheists that they're actually practicing a religion called atheism. Atheists telling Christians that to have a religion is merely to be superstitious. I find these sorts of things to just be conversation stoppers more often than they contribute to any conversation. And like I said, here on this show, I like a good discussion. It seems to me that if we value reason, if we value life, our fellow human beings, our communities, our social sources of meaning, and so forth, then our efforts at self-examination and at listening fairly to those that share the world with us should be proportional to the claims we make about just how much we do value all these things. Too frequently, it doesn't seem like that's the case. We are all human, after all. But coming together to have these kinds of dialogues is a step towards addressing that. As a reminder, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash godlesshaven, on Twitter at at godlesshaven, and you can find this podcast on iTunes in addition to the website. Please drop by on iTunes and give us a rating or review if you can to help promote the show. Thanks again, guys, for all your support. And with that, let's jump into the interview. Kevin Shellbrock teaches in the Philosophy and Religion Department at Appalachian State University. He is a graduate of Chicago Divinity School and has published widely on the conceptual and philosophical issues arising in the cross-cultural study of religions. He is the contributing editor of books such as Thinking Through Myths and Thinking Through Rituals, and his most recent work, Philosophy and the Study of Religions, a Manifesto, was published by Wiley Blackwell in 2014. Dr. Shellbrock, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Taylor. I'm happy to be here. So to start off, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background for you, just sort of what your journey has been so far to where you're at now and if you came from any sort of religious background. Uh, I guess you would say that I did. Um, My parents were educated liberal Catholics, and um, I was raised going to church with mom and... uh, when I got to be a teenager, uh, Dad sent me and my brothers to um, private Catholic school. And so until then, I'd been in public school, but from the time I was 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, there was theology classes there at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas High School. Um, but even so, I think uh, I was never very convinced and always pretty skeptical and I would say that I, I settled on a self-understanding as an atheist about the time I was, I don't know, 14 or 16 or something like that. I, I always was curious about what we owe each other and what the purpose of our lives were and those kinds of existentialist questions that teenage kids have. Um, but uh, I wouldn't... I, I don't ever remember a time when I thought that the answer was to be found in the Bible or, or in church. So how did you end up uh, specifically interested in studying philosophy and uh, religion? Did one of those sort of come first for you? No, not really. Um, 
I'm one of those people that uh, is bookish and introspective. Uh, I liked reading uh, uh, fiction and history and about cultures around the world. I'm thinking about when I was in high school and when I started college. Um, thought I'd be an art major. I liked the history classes. I uh, had a science fiction class with a teacher who was great. Uh, this is at Rollins College, which is uh, in Central Florida, a good liberal arts college. But um, uh, they had a combined philosophy and religion department and uh, amazing faculty who wanted to um, uh, get students talking in the classroom and thinking critically about, I guess you'd say, life questions about um, oh, race and gender and truth and goodness and reality and, and, and those kinds of things. I remember a professor sat down his coffee cup on the center of the table in a class on phenomenology and said, you know, you have to describe this, but don't bring in any assumptions. And I can remember being all tongue-tied and trying to do that. Um, so, uh, no, it was a combined apartment, and my, my, my undergraduate degree was combined. And uh, the, the way I think about it now, uh, and maybe this is obvious to um, a, a, a lot of people, is that uh, philosophy is a discipline, and it's a disciplined way of inquiring into things. So you can be a philosopher of uh, law, a philosopher of science, a philosopher of ethics. Um, I was a philosopher of religion, um, but my approach to the questions was always philosophical. Well, religious studies, as I understand it, is not a discipline at all. It's a multidisciplinary field that's united by the object into which everyone is inquiring. So you get philosophers of religion, but you also get historians of religion and sociologists of religion and psychologists of religion and so forth. So I'm, I'm at that meeting point between a, a, a disciplined way to look at different things, and the thing I want to look at is part of a multidisciplinary field, but I feel like I was doing more or less that as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student, and then I've been lucky enough to be hired at universities that, that, that let me straddle that discipline and that multidisciplinary field for, uh, for all of my career. So I guess I started teaching in uh, 94 or 95, so gosh, that's more than 20 years ago. Well, great. That sounds like a good uh, way to sort of get into what I want to be the, the subject, I guess, of this interview is uh, uh, what you mentioned with all the different uh, facets surrounding the study of religion. That raises the question, of course, of, of what exactly we're talking about when we talk about religion. And uh, as, as you're probably well aware, um, there's a long history of varying definitions for it, too. And uh, from what I understand of it, the current concept of it, as it's at least popularly understood, is pretty recent. So maybe you could start off by just giving us a little bit of this background picture to what religion is uh, taken to mean. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, I, I love this observation that our, our words and concepts have a history. And so what we mean by religion now would be um, quite different from someone living about, let's say, uh, 200 years ago. Let's say uh, founding fathers, you know, writing about religion in the First Amendment or something like that. Or, or let alone 400 years ago. Um, so where would that put us? That would be uh, in the beginning of the 17th century. Um, or even a thousand years ago. So, uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by the evolution, or, or, or philosophers like to say, the genealogy of, of, of the concept of religion. And um, uh, in, in, in the book, I, uh, I, I mark four stages, so that if we were living in about Christopher Columbus's time, let's say, um, and someone said, what is your religion? They would mean, they would mean by the word, um, the Christian religion. And if you said, well, I have a religion, but it's not the Christian religion, they'd be confused already by the way you were trying to use the word. Um, they assumed that to be in the Christian religion, and to be in, to, to be religious was to um, practice uh, a commitment to the God of the Bible and to the Christian God. And they thought that there were pre uh, you know, precursors to the Christian religion and Judaism, and they thought there were heresies of different kind and kinds, and maybe Islam would go there. But if you said, well, I'm not talking about precursors or heresies, I'm talking about the religions of the people of Africa or India or China, they, they would have no idea how you were using the word. So that, for me, is stage one, where the word religion means Christianity. Um, after the Reformation, though, there was um, explicit 
proposal that was debated that we could speak of the word religion in a more generic way so that anyone who believed that there was one supreme God would have a religion. Uh, if that is the definition of the word religion, the belief and practice of worship of a uh, one supreme God, then you could realize there are religious people in India. Uh, there are Jews are a different religion than Christians. Muslims are a different religion than Christians, and, and, and Christians themselves have multiple religions. And, and I presumably that was the pressure to to develop the concept in that new direction, that broader, more generic di direction. I would say the third stage is the most common today among scholars of religion and maybe anthropologists too, which is to say there doesn't have to be one supreme being grounding one's practices or one's worship or one's sacrifices or one's meditation in order to have a religion, as long as there's any spiritual being or any supernatural being. So if somebody believes that the ancestors can be asked for for help so you can ask the deceased members of one's family for help. Um, if one believes that there are animal spirits that can be asked for help or, or who might harm you and have to be placated in some way, if you've got spiritual beings of some kind, it doesn't have to be one supreme being. So you can see a shift from a monotheistic definition of religion to a um, polytheistic definition of religion. That's stage three. And then in the book, I... I, I I point out that there's quite a few people now who would define the term religion with no no spiritual beings or supernatural beings. There might be a spiritual or supernatural power or force like the law of karma or the Tao or the Logos or, or the Confucian philosophers who talk about Li, L-I, like a principle that undergirds all of the world, all of the uh, every um, event in nature, um, and most people commonly now refer to those as religions too. Taoism, let's say, or or early Buddhism, they will call a religion, even if there is no reverence towards um, spiritual beings. So, as I see it, that's the evolution of those four stages. And I was recommending in the book that fourth stage is the most inclusive. You know, kind of just touching on what you said about the history of it and just kind of how fascinating that is, that's one of the questions that often kind of perplexes me that I hear sometimes from people is, you know, if, if you're an atheist, if you are not religious, then why do you care about religion? And that, to me, has just seemed like, why why would you not care about it? It's, it's just kind of ubiquitous around us, you know, not just Christianity yeah. here in the U.S., but the different ways that people understand it and define their religious life and the religious practices that they take up and uh, just that history of it is an interesting thing to study from itself just how closely it parallels the sorts of uh, social developments that were going on at those times too like you just kind of laid out yeah I, I, I feel like the the concept of religion that evolving concept that I just described it it, it it changes over time, but it also maps how people were thinking of the natural world. Is the natural world somehow permeable or open to the influence of powers that you could never see with the bare eyes, you could never touch, but they're there and they're influencing your health or they're influencing the weather? Um, shifting ideas about what nature is, shifting ideas about what authority is, political authority, um, is our ruler somehow a descendant of those powers or in tune with those powers or in control of those powers? So I, I feel like the, the, the concepts that you and I are talking about right now, they, they, they give us a vocabulary for thinking about history of science, history of politics, self-understanding of people in the West. And, and, and as you said, it's ubiquitous now in the sense that people in India, people in Japan, uh, people in the Sudan, they're using this language. It may not have been their language 200, 400,000 years ago, but they're using it now as part of their own um, articulation of how they understand themselves. Well, that also gets us into what some of the common complaints are, just kind of like you've already brought up. Um, it doesn't seem like there can just be this sort of uh, like groundless idea of what religion is. 
But on the other hand, like you also mentioned, I think, a few minutes ago, there's also been this pushback against kind of a uh, defining uh, religion in terms of what you've called a super empirical reality. So maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about some of the complaints that have been raised against some of these different understandings of religion. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, To focus on complaints, though, I I would like to talk about one strategy for defining religion that I haven't really brought up yet, but it's so common. And for me, that's my bete noir. That's my um, the the definition of religion that I find frustrating and and provocative at the same time, and and it's this. So um, if a person is worshiping God, uh, let's say, and they're devoting their life to it, then that would be their religion. But what if they um, revere some other power or idea so much that they they structure their values all around that? So some people define religion um, in terms of what orients your life or what puts the greatest um, uh, concern or commitment or, or calling on your life. And it doesn't have to be God. So this is a definition, uh, I guess, the scholar who's most associated with this view is Paul Tillich, the Christian theologian, who said, whatever a person's ultimate concern is, that's the faith. And nobody, that's their faith. And no one doesn't have that, have a faith. And so some people would define your religion as your ultimate concern. And if your ultimate concern is not anything supernatural, but it's your desire to be rich, and you wake up in the morning and it gets you out of bed, and it it's the highest value for you, so that if you have to choose between being in a personal relationship with somebody or making more money, you'd just rather make more money. Uh, um, you can imagine that this is someone's hi- ultimate concern, or it is their highest value. And so the question is whether we should call it their religion. Should we call someone who loves money and lives for money uh, a money-worshipping person? Or if they love their country and they're willing to die for their country and nothing else matters to them more than um, the Constitution as a kind of sacred text, should, according to this definition, that would be their their religion. And, and this is such a, uh, as I said before, a provocative definition because then you'll, you'll, you'll see that everyone has a religion of some kind or another. They worship money, they worship their nation, they worship sex, they worship... Uh, you know, their favorite band. Um, and you can see a rock concert as a kind of ecstatic, worshipful experience. But I'm frustrated by this definition, and it's really the one that I'm, I'm, I'm opposing the most, I guess you'd say, in my book, because then, by definition, everyone is religious, and, and the idea that a, a person has become a secular or non-religious person or that a society has become a secular or non-religious society doesn't make sense anymore. Everybody would have a ultimate concern, so everybody in every society would have a religion. Um, maybe even every activity that we do would have this religious element. And, and I can see how that's a provocative way to think about the world, and maybe it helps you see why somebody would be so caught up in love of their nation. But I still resist it. I, I find it The costs of this definition are um, too great for me in the sense that then I can't distinguish between religious and non-religious activities, religious and non-religious people, religious and non-religious societies. And so uh, uh, I I like the definition that I mentioned before more, which is to say the definition uh, um, practices that are based on some super empirical reality. And if it's your nation or money, that would not be, for me, a super empirical reality, and so I wouldn't call it a religion. But it's uh, it's worth thinking through, and it's worth realizing that how we define religion is a strategy that helps us uh, illuminate some aspects of, of the world and, and puts others in shadow, no matter which definition we pick. Well, and it seems to me, too, like, especially with Tillich's view, um, that these are usually... I mean, these are ways that we do describe certain things as they appear to us that other people do. Like we'd say, you know, sports is a religion to him. But it's not quite clear that what people mean by that. In fact, I would say I don't think most people do mean that that's actually a religion for him. That's kind of like a metaphor that we use to describe sort of like, you know, the sincerity that he bestows on something like sports. I like that. I agree with that. 
So uh, one thing that does often also seem to get left out of much of this discourse, especially at the popular non-academic level, um, is this self-ascription of these individuals and groups that are being called religious. And I've heard, unfortunately, this from many of my fellow atheists, of just uh, kind of like uh, blanket generalizing religion as just superstition and stuff like that. So should we concern ourselves with how religious people understand what it is that they're doing or believing? And the more fun question here, as I see it, is what weight should we give to their views? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the answer that I give in the book has generated some pushback and some controversy. So, so let me see if I can sketch it really quickly, and then your listeners can decide for themselves um, where they stand. So your question is, um, should should we concern ourselves with the self understanding of people who say that they're religious or say that some, something or rather is their religion, um, and how much weight should we give to it? So my answer, uh, well, well, let me let me back up. Some people in the academic study of religion are very, let's say, uh, warm and supportive of the practitioner and of the insider's view, and they say we should give the highest weight and the most credence to the way people understand themselves. And then there's another contingent who are pretty cold and um, critical of the insider's view, and they say the insider's view shouldn't matter at, at, at all because we're the scholars and we've got this project that we're trying to understand society, and, and people who are um, being studied are, uh, shouldn't control the the what scholars do or or how they're studied. If you're just going to report what they themselves think of themselves, then you're just you've become an insider. So I'm trying to navigate between that those two extremes. And, and my view is that if you're watching watching somebody who's putting water on their child, let's say they're scooping it up with their hand and they're putting it on their kid, are they washing their kid because they want the kid to be physically clean? Or are they baptizing the kid because they want the kid to be spiritually clean? I don't know how to tell that from uh, just observation. I want to ask the practitioner, what do you think that you yourself are doing? What, what's the activity you're involved in right now? And if they said it's called giving a bath, then it's in one category. And if they say it's called a baptism, then it's in the other category. And so I agree with the insider and with the religious practitioner that they get to identify what their actions are. And if I say I'm going to ignore what they think they're doing, I'm just going to watch them from the outside, so to speak, and, and watch their behavior. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to figure out what their activity is. So I look to them to identify the activity. There's another question, though. Let's say that somebody is baptizing their child. You might as a scholar think, but the reason why they're doing this is because, oh, they think that there's a father figure up in the sky who gets angry if they don't do it, and I'm a Freudian, and I want to explain what they're doing, as, as Freud does in the book, The Future of an Illusion, as, you know, they've got a hang-ups about patriarchy, and they... they they, they just want to be loved and watched over by some invisible, perfect father. So you can come up with an explanation of what they're doing that they themselves might object to and disagree with. But I think that's completely appropriate for the scholar. So I hope that you can hear that I've got a both and answer. First, you have to ask them what they think they're doing in order to identify the action. But once you've identified that this is a baptism, that's a sacrifice, this other thing is a pilgrimage, if you if you identify it as some kind of religious behavior, then you've got all the uh, the rights as a scholar to say, well, I want to explain that religious behavior in terms that the practitioner themselves might not agree with because I'm a Marxist and I think that uh, their religion is an opiate of a certain kind that placates their sense of of, of suffering in the world, or I'm a Freudian, or I, I don't know, I've got any uh, any number of, of theories that you'll get exposed to in a class on theories of religion. You can't discount what people think they're doing, otherwise you won't be able to identify it. That's my view. But you don't have to give them the final word about why they're doing it. So you can't reduce what they say descriptively, but you can reduce what they say explanatorily. I hope that's a sophisticated answer, but not a confusing one. 
Yeah, I don't think it's confusing. Uh, just on that, actually, um, do you think that part of part of what that helps to sort of defer to these individuals and the practices as they see them yeah. is that it helps to avoid confusing the two between description and explanation? Because there's often a lot of times it seems like like in sociology of religion exactly. where certain things seem like they're being defined, but what they're actually being is explained. That's exactly right. I mean, you can think of three camps. One is that warm camp that says our goal in the academic study of religion is just to understand the world from the religious perspective. You want to ask empathetically some religious practitioners, what do you think you're doing? And why do you do it? And what's this called? And what's the history? And who's in charge here? And, and you you don't report anything that the insider themselves would not agree to, agree, to, agree with. Um, that's one extreme that I, I think is half right but half wrong. The other extreme is, well, we don't care what they think they're doing. We know better than they do. We're going to explain it. And um, the insider's perspective, we want to uh, set that aside as theological or as, or as, uh, as you suggested when you asked the question, it's, it's superstitious. Uh, I think those are both extremes, and you need to at least interview or read the text in order to understand what the practitioners, uh, under, how the way they understand themselves, to, just to identify their action. But once you get that, like as you said, once you define, oh, this is a pilgrimage, it's not just tourism, uh, this is a baptism, it's not just taking a bath, um, then you might have an apparatus, an explanatory apparatus where you say, and I can see what the function this serves for this person psychologically, or the function it serves for this community politically. Um, the insiders might not like that, but that's what distinguishes the academic study of religion from just um, repeating what the insiders say. So you've argued that religion should be defined both functionally, kind of like we've just been discussing, right. and uh, substantively. Right. Can you talk some about these different kinds of strategies and why you think that both are important to an account of religion? Well, you know, I think it's the danger in religious studies, but really you'll find the same thing in sociology and political science. And, and whenever you start to become reflective about your life is that we have these opposed categories and it's easy to slide into one or the other in a kind of monolithic approach where you, you, you're, you're missing the other half of the equation. So the, the two approaches that you mentioned, the, what I called in the book the functional and the substantive, the function, a, 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 a functional definition of religion captures the fact that the, practice, the religious practices that someone might do, the sacrifices or pilgrimages or baptisms or meditation or reading of a text, that that plays a role in their life, shaping their understanding of who they are and what to do with their money and how to raise their kids and what comes after death and what to think of, of their community, whether it's a good one or a bad one and how to change it. So it's, it's functions in their life. That's all true. Um, and if you said, well, religion is whatever has the highest function, then you end up with that Talikian ultimate concern definition. But as I'm suggesting, that's one-sided and it's missing the other side. Uh, the other side is the substantive approach that says, well, you have to have God in there, or if not God, you have to have spiritual beings of some kind in there. If you exaggerate that side and you only focus on the belief in God or the belief in spiritual beings of some kind, then you drop the function out and you might say, well, that person who's walking down the street, I asked them if they believe in God and they said yes, so that makes that a religious person. But if it doesn't function in their life in any way, if they answered yes, but they don't go to church and they don't read any scriptures and they're not a member of any community, it's just a mere belief in their mind, uh, for me, that doesn't sound like a religion. It's just a, a conceptual thing. It's a proposition they assented to, but I wouldn't call it that person's religion. So I'd like to see both. I'd like to say... Whatever uh, commitments the person has, practices that they have that are predicated on, based on uh, belief in some kind of super empirical reality, like a god or like multiple gods or the Tao or some super powerful force like the Logos the, and the other energies that I mentioned before, the law of karma, 
that functions to structure their life and their family and their community and their values, that seems to me to be a perfect definition of religion. Um, so you actually brought up something just a second ago yeah. that got me curious about something, because one of the things that, that we've seen from a lot of the really interesting polls about, especially here in the U.S., is that there are a lot of people out there who, you know, despite um, preferring to call themselves religious, when you sort of look at the survey questions that they answer, there's really not a whole lot on the functional side that seems to be checked off on those boxes. So, um, I mean, how would you address a problem like that where it seems like these people are leaning heavily towards the maybe cognitive or uh, – or propositional side of religion, and yet they don't, you know, attend a church, they don't really read their Bibles, they don't really, you know, do a lot of the things that we would typically call religious practices. That's a great question, Taylor. And I think you've you've heard this, that sometimes those boxes are, you know, would you identify as a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim? And then at the bottom it says none of the above, and people will check that none of the above uh, box and... Uh, there's an increase, right, of people who don't identify with any particular institutionalized religion, and they, they're just a nun, not an N-U-N, nun, right, but a N-O-N-E, nun. Um, and the kind of poll or questionnaire that you're describing that says something like, do you believe it, that there's a God, doesn't capture the fact that that person is broken with the institution or the, 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 they, in which they grew up and... And all they have left maybe is some residual beliefs in X, Y, or Z. But uh, if there's no function, then I, I think I would rather categorize them as a nun or, or even as an atheist if they say, yeah, I guess the universe had to come from somewhere, but um, it has no function in their life, then it doesn't sound like it's a religion, although it might still be a residual supernatural belief of some kind. So on that note, then, yeah. where does normativity fit into this view? Because that is something that... Uh Oftentimes, you know, the values that people get and the the ways of life that they get from their religious traditions are a hugely important thing to them, too. Let's say another word about normativity. Do you mean um, normativity on my part as a, as a scholar and as a philosopher, or do you mean the, the values that the person's got out, out there? Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, I was thinking more specifically of the values that the... the the uh, adherent has, but it can be a either or question, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, let me do both. Um, I, I think people imitate each other. They Im- imitate each other's activities and they imitate each other's desires. So as we're um, embedded in some kind of community or family or society, people come to say that's the kind of thing that's worthy of desire. This other kind of thing is not worthy of desire. And, and these kinds of uh, habits and behaviors, they may not have been, ever been named. Eventually they are, and people say this is what's attractive and this is what's moral and this is what's proper. Um, but even before that stage, I think we have um, tendencies and dispositions and habits. Uh, so normativity pervades our social life. I think human beings are... Uh, what would you say, value-laden, normative creatures. And and absolutely, in the study of religion, I wouldn't want to um, reduce it to, well, what beliefs do they have about what happens after death? That's interesting, and I don't want to drop that out, but I'm mostly interested in in what you're calling the norms that structure their behavior, which they may have codified into some kind of a book, but they may never have. They may have justified according to stories of their founding um, ancestors or something like that, but they may not have. Sometimes you have to observe someone to see what they value and care about. But I wanted to answer both of your questions because the normativity is a um, dangerous word in the academy. I think we're living in a time when STEM disciplines are um, celebrated and championed as as most productive either for the person who gets a job after they graduate or you know for the community that funds those things i'm from florida and um there's questions about whether or not students should be allowed to get financial aid if they study philosophy or religion um i don't want higher education to shift to become 
value neutral or scientistic in the sense that questions, ethical questions about right and wrong, normative questions about what a democracy, uh, what members of a, a democracy should pursue, or what justice is about, and basically philosophical questions about what's good and true and real and just. Um, I don't want those to drop out of the academy, and so I don't want them to drop out of the academic study of religions. I think that outside of the university, people are making value judgments about religions 24-7. They think some of them are, are dangerous and superstitious, and um, others are uh, healthy and, uh, I don't know, get you in t- tune with the earth, or, or they, they overcome racial hostility. People have judged re- re- religious practices and beliefs all the time, but I don't think that judgment should be excluded from the university. I think the philosophical study of religion that asks, is a religious practice a moral one? Is a religious institution a just one? Is a religious belief a, 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 a plausible one, um, justifiable one? Those are all appropriate questions for the university, and I would hate to see the university become a place for mere technical training. And it makes me wonder, too, this is something that you also address in your book, yeah. um, kind of like you like you just mentioned a little bit, the social sciences are value-laden, and it seems like if we're engaged in the academy, like speaking as someone who's been to the university, a lot of the classes and subjects that I've taken, part of those courses, uh, an important part of it to me, is that we're not just looking at the specific subjects and the concrete details and stuff. We're also kind of looking at the methodology and sort of the discipline itself and how it operates. And if, kind of like you said, scholars are already bringing their own perspectives and interests and stuff like that to their work, then why wouldn't we be looking at and asking questions about these sorts of uh these sorts of issues as they come out in the in the academy and the disciplines that we're studying. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, as I said a, a few minutes ago, I think people live these value-laden, norm-laden lives, and that's not true only of the people, religious people that scholars study. I think scholars themselves have ideologies and political agendas and, and uh, assumptions about what's moral and what's just there's a weird tension between uh, within a scholar who says something like um, I want to practice scholarship and be the kind of professor who liberates students from backwards ways of thinking and I want to do that by having a value free science that doesn't import to the classroom any particular values, there's a contradiction there. And so I want the scholars of religion to understand their own normative location, and I think philosophy is exactly the discipline that reflects critically on those things. So I guess I'm, in the end, I'm arguing for the legitimacy of philosophy, not just of the study of religious people, but of the study of religious scholars. And one of the criticisms I've heard that's been brought up of that is specifically the Christian history of a lot of these disciplines, uh, philosophy of religion in particular. But then that seems like you would also want to bring in those questions because that way if you do have someone who happens to be of a certain tradition who's teaching one of these classes, there's a better opportunity to, at least in my view, in my opinion, avoid just a straight sort of handing down of their own particular opinion on, you know, other religions and other traditions and stuff like that. That's why, you know, I've had professors who have been Christians, who have been atheists, who have been lots of different, uh, you know, other religions and other uh, other different backgrounds, and there have been some who have just come right out and said that straight up front, and then there have been others who have just left you guessing towards the end of the class and stuff, yeah. and uh, that can be fun too, but then if those questions are sort of never brought up, it it kind of creates this problem, it seems like, of, you know, well, I'm getting a perspective, but you may not be aware of where that perspective is coming from. That's a good observation. Uh, I think the critics, 
who say that the word religion, I talked about its history before and how it began as just a word for the Christians had for what they themselves did. Um, the, the po- people who point that out are not wrong. I think the word does have a Christian genealogy or Christian history. It's got a Western genealogy or Western history. Um, I just don't... Uh, I, I think the choices are these. I think if you say... If you look at the world from a Christian perspective, then you see that these social structures might be called religious. But if you if you see the world from an um, Islamic perspective, you would call them something else. Or if you see it from a Chinese or an Indian perspective, you, you, you'd recognize that it has other features that you hadn't noticed before that perhaps were put into shadow by the concepts you were using. That's a legitimate kind of comparative enterprise. The only thing I, I resist is the idea that what we should do is not speak from a Western perspective at all because, uh, well, that, maybe that's not quite the right way to put it, but that we have to speak from a, a position that's nowhere at all. Um, I don't think anyone's language is free-floating or doesn't have a history or doesn't even have a, um, uh, a dark history where the words have been used to exclude certain people or oppress certain people. Religion has been used that way. The critics are all correct about that. Um, I don't think that we're going to be able to find a vocabulary that's neutral, though, or or free from um, uh, bias at all, that's somehow God's own language or something like that. The best we can do is taking uh, multiple perspectives and, and, and stand in one and then move to another and see uh, the world from as many angles as we can. I think religious studies is especially strong in that precisely because it's a multidisciplinary field. So you also suggest as part of the substantive uh, strategy yeah. that uh, super empirical realities are something we should incorporate into an understanding of religion. So what exactly is super empirical here and what distinguishes this from a definition like, uh, I don't remember his first name, Tyler, was it Edward Tyler? Um, yeah. Uh, who speaks of something like spiritual or supernatural beings? Yeah, the word super empirical, um, it, it's good to focus on that. And I think someone who was writing about my book um, c- could focus on this in a, in a productive way. Uh, the first thing to say is that, uh, for me, it's a word I invented trying to solve a problem. Um, the, the problem is, is this. If you if you see the history of the definition of religion, getting up to the point, uh, as you said, that Edward Tyler said, well, let's count anything that has spiritual agents of a certain kind, spiritual beings like ghosts and devils and uh, ancestors and gods and sprites or, or, or whatever kinds of uh, non-empirical spiritual beings there are. Um, but he, he didn't have a way to include um, the law of karma or nirvana or uh, Buddha nature, what Mahayana Buddhists call Buddha nature, or what Stoics call Logos, or the Confucians call Principle, um, or the Tao. None of those are beings or agents, and they don't have any minds, and they can't answer prayers. Uh, so none of those things would be religions. And the question is, what word could we come up with that would include the spiritual beings that Tyler talked about, and all these forces and powers and energies that I just listed. And so my words, uh, super empirical, was supposed to gather both of those things. And so the basic idea is this, that there are empirical realities all around us. I've got a, a glass of water I'm drinking here and a pen in front of me, and those are empirical objects around me. But there are non-empirical things, too. I think probably pride is not empirical and the number two is probably not empirical. The, the question then is, are there any non-empirical things that are not the product of anything empirical? And that's what I'm—that's my special definition of the word super-empirical. So just to summarize, like I invented the word in order to come up with a label for all the things that are the objects of religious concern in whether they're beings or not beings, but they're not... Uh, the product of something empirical. So they don't include nations, which are created by people, and the Constitution, which is written by the Founding Fathers, and uh, 
capitalism, which you know is created by markets and so forth. Those are all nations and money can be non-empirical, but they're not super empirical because they're not the product. Uh, they are the product of some empirical beings. So I'm trying to come up with a word that justifies what I consider to be the common way of speaking about religion that says, well, Buddhism's a religion, and if someone says why, you can say because it's a bunch of practices based on super empirical realities like Buddha nature and the law of karma. Um, I think that this proposal about the word super empirical works for everything that people call uh, a religion now, but it doesn't include the worship of a rock band or a nation or of money or of sex or any of those other things I listed. So that was my goal. Um, Would it include then something kind of more like uh, in the philosophical systems of like Platonism, there's the good, or in Hegel, there's Geist? It would include something like that, though? Uh, it, it, it would if there's any... Um, I mean, uh, those are super empirical realities, yeah, absolutely. But it, the question is whether there's any... Um, practical function. When you asked me before whether uh, why a religion had to have a functional element, and if and if someone said um, that, this is interesting. Think about this. Let's contrast Hegel and Plato, which I've never. Uh, what I'm about to say, I've never said before. If somebody says so, both Hegel's Geist and Plato's forms are um, super empirical. I think that's right. But if someone said um, to Hegel, so do you have a community that structures its existence on Geist, uh, or, or, or even you know, a, uh, a, an individual who, who bases her life on her understanding of Geist? Not really. He never had any um, functional value of that. No one prayed to it or sacrificed to it or made pilgrimages to it. It was a concept that he thought illuminated human history. Um, but it didn't have a functional role for any community. Plato's might have, though. If you said to Plato, do you think that what your philosophy has identified, this super empirical reality, ought to ground our behavior and uh, the behavior of a, of a collection of people that have realized this truth? I think he might have said yes. You know, you know the um, scholar of ancient philosophy named Pierre Hadot? He says that uh, classical philosophy all was a spiritual exercise so that you were supposed to regulate your desires and structure your friendships and ultimately your polis on these super empirical realities. It's really the division of the functional value of super empirical realities um, from their discovery that separates modern philosophy like Hegel's from classical philosophy like Plato's. It's definitely a gray area where there's you might say, well, they sort of base their lives on it in a sense, but um, clearly not on the sense that a monastery does. There's no community uh, reverently following um, the directives of, of Plato's phenomenology or something like that. So maybe there's sure. a gray area, and, and after the book came out, I, I've, I've developed another, uh, I've published another, another paper talking about um, a family resemblance definition of religion. <clears throat> so that there's something that's clearly or paradigmatically a religion, which might be a um, a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a monastery, and then there's borderline cases. It's a, there's a gray area, and then there's some things that uh, I don't think anybody would call a religion, like a a post office or walking your dog or, like you said before, going to a rock concert. I like the example of fly fishing that you brought up yeah. in the book because that was just kind of like I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody call fly fishing a religion, but it seems like from the description that you gave of it that it could be for some people maybe. But, well, but uh, there's that great area, uh, right? Or even with the love yeah. of the nation, because some people will say, yeah, I think the founding fathers wrote the Constitution and they were empirical creatures. You know, if you were standing there, you would have just seen them riding away. Um, but some people would say, but they were inspired. They had a, there was a kind of providential or, um, uh, guidance there, or divine inspiration there, and, and then you end up with a religious natural na uh, uh, nationalism. Um, there's no reason why something cannot be political and also religious. Just because it's uh, political doesn't mean it's secular in my eyes. Well, that's a great segue then into the next question, which is. Uh 
one of the things that my listeners in particular will probably be interested in yeah. is non-theistic religions, secularization, and non-religious communities are some examples of phenomena that are regularly raised as objections in these debates about what is religion, what's not religion. Um, how do you see your contribution to this debate then as dealing with these sorts of social realities? I do, and, and I think that those are the kinds of questions that we're wrestling with as we, I mean, the, the last 400 years that I talked about has been this massive explosion of immigration all around the world and increased technological knowledge of, of, of the variety of human cultures all around the world, and we need to develop a vocabulary that helps us grasp what people are up to, and I'm hoping that the words, the, the proposals I make in, the, in my book help people with that. So one of your questions was, are there non-theistic religions? And uh, yeah, according to my my the words that we've been you and I've been talking about for the last hour, if if someone has a super empirical reality that's not a god, but it's still the foundation for their uh, sacrifices and pilgrimages and baptisms and so forth, uh, then they have a non-theistic religion. If they have a super empirical reality that's not a god, then um, that's a substantive meets both the substantive and the functional definition of religion, even though it doesn't have a God. So I think uh, Columbus's definition that I, I mentioned a long time ago, or Edward Tyler's definition, is not a very good one, because he get, then gets uh, flummoxed when he gets to Thailand, or uh, when he gets to Japan. It's not clear exactly how to categorize, um, I don't know, let's say Zen Buddhism. Uh, right, and Buddhism's been a stumbling block for definitions of religion for a long time, but I think it fits perfectly in, 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 in my description. So there's non-theistic religions, and, but you asked about secularism too. If, if someone um, gives up the notion that some super empirical reality grounds our values, or even that it has to ground our value, imagine that the person's just some kind of practical-minded, scientific-minded naturalist who says, you know, I think that there's lots of empirical realities and they have relationships and causal powers and dispositions that we can study as scientists and social scientists, but I don't believe there's any super empirical reality. I don't think we even need it in order to find a path forward about how to treat each other well and so forth. I mean, there's no reason why you can't have a non, non-religious ethics or non-religious politics or a secular society. So I'm hoping, again, that my language of the way I define religion and in in, in this concept of super empirical realities helps answer both your question about non-theistic religions and your question about uh, secular societies, non-religious communities. Absolutely, I think they exist. Although, as you can imagine, right, philosophers argue about that, and if you define religion in a different way, you might say there is no such thing as a community that doesn't have religion. That's not my view, but it uh, shows the importance of how we we define religion when we start, otherwise it, it, it'll shape our conclusions in ways that might seem um, confusing or unhelpful. Well, what do you have on the horizon then for the future? Is there anything new coming up that you want to mention, or where can listeners go to find out more about you and your work? Yeah, I'm at Appalachian State University, and I think I'm e- easy to Google, and, and and someone would be welcome to email me or or follow me on, on that website, academia.edu, where I've been posting my papers. Um, but I am excited now because I'm about halfway through or more than halfway through a, a, another book. And, and the basic idea of this, I think it's a, in some ways a sequel to the things that you and I have been talking about, um, but in some ways it, it, it's um, learning from some groundbreaking cognitive scientists and social ontologists. The basic idea is this. Um, I think it's a mistake to think of what a person does as the product of what they're thinking in their heads. So they have mental states. I, I, I think that's true, but I think our minds and our bodies are much more integrated than most philosophers in, over the last few hundred years have said. I, 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 I feel like I'm the beneficiary and recipient of lots of pragmatists and and uh, phenomenologists and existentialists, lots of postmodern philosophers who are trying to overcome this Cartesian bias that thinks that uh, human human uh, behavior is a, just a product of what people think. Uh, I think people's minds and bodies are integrated, and um, I want to come to understand religion better as 
you know, let's say religious thought as something we do as embodied persons, not as disembodied minds. So the fact that we're vertical, the fact that um, our faces have our eyes in the front and not on the sides, the how long we live, the fact uh, the facts about how we reproduce um, sexually, all those things shape um, the way we think about the world. So that's our physical bodies, but I think we're also in social bodies in the sense that people might say this this body of people is a, a movement or something like that. I think we're not just embodied, but also embedded in the sense that we're part of a collective, and that shapes our thinking, that we're, we're part of a, a reality that's moving in a certain direction, and we're participating in it in the habits and, and imitative ways that I mentioned before. Uh, but sometimes also the groups that we're a part of, we reflect on them, and we come to name them, and we say, well, this is my the movement I'm a part of, or this is the church I'm a part of, or the or the tradition I'm a part of. And whether or not they're named, though, those social structures are there guiding um, our, our 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 perception of the world and, and our patterns of thinking. So my next book will probably be called something like Religion Embodied and Embedded, and it'll try to have a post-Cartesian, post-modern um, account of how religious thought and religious behavior is. Um, something that embodied persons do as part of social networks. Well, I look forward to that. Actually, reading about the uh, embodied cognitive science sections in, in that book was one of the most interesting parts of it to me because that's not uh, something that I have a, a wide experience with. I think you'd mentioned that it's it's kind of a more recent field, too. Yeah, it's blowing my mind, to be honest. There, it's um, uh, Embodied cognitive science is just an exploding field that's, uh, I guess you'd call it a research program because it includes some phenomenologists and some people studying um, apes and, and, and ethology and um, some people studying uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, brain science, um, some people call it neurophilosophy, uh, uh, amazing stuff about how integrated our thoughts are with our ability to move our hands in certain ways the metaphors that we derive from movement and um, uh, I think they call it proprioception as you feel what it's like to be in your body and you can find what's vertical for you. Um, it's great stuff. It's uh, I, I definitely disagree with those people who think that there's nothing new under the sun and everyone, everything's been said before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Shellbrock, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it, was a, it was an absolute pleasure, Taylor. Thanks. I'd like to thank Dr. Shellbrock for coming on the show. If you'd like to find out more about him or purchase any of his books, links are available in the description for this episode at godlesshaven.com. At godlesshaven.com, you can also find out more about the show, more about myself, and plenty of additional content. Music in the show is my own work. Thank you for listening, and please join me again in the not-too-distant future for another episode of Armchair Atheism.